The Arkham Asylum for the Criminally Insane opened its doors in Gotham City, New Jersey, during the year 1879. The asylum's founder, Amadeus Arkham, was inspired by the trend in construction of mental hospitals in New England throughout the 1870s. He himself was from Danvers, Massachusetts, which had its own asylum opened up just a year prior, in 1878. His brother Jeremiah also moved to Gotham, along with Jeremiah's wife, Helen, and their daughter, Martha. Martha Arkham would eventually go on to marry Thomas Wayne years later. For the building's construction, Amadeus was inspired by the floor plans developed by Thomas Story Kirkbride in the 1840s, known as the Kirkbride Plans. Amadeus was familiar with this style of building from his time in Essex County, which was popular among the hospitals he worked at. Being an orderly who witnessed firsthand the abuse and malpractice against the patients, he became disgruntled and vowed to invest his earnings in his own hospital, one which would treat its patients humanely and with modern medical practices, not crucifixion therapies and exorcisms. Throughout the years, Arkham Asylum has held some of the most infamous and bizarre criminals in Gotham's history within the confines of its stone walls. One of the first patients to be incarcerated at the asylum was Victor Zaz, a man who went on a mercy-killing spree after experiencing an existential crisis. Victor had a mundane job as a tax collector, collecting debts for the city government. He would go knocking on doors, regretfully informing people of the money they owed. It was a job Victor felt bad for having. He would catch brief glimpses into the lives of those he visited, being able to see over their shoulder a stack of bills piling on a desk, a couple of starving kids, or a sickly wheelchair-bound spouse. These people's lives were broken, and all Victor did was worsen their circumstances. That was his whole job description, squeezing money out of people going through hard times. Ironically, Victor often owed money to others himself, as he had a severe gambling addiction. Supposedly at the lowest point in his life, Victor stumbled across the philosophies of solipsism and nihilism. It's undetermined how exactly he was introduced to these subject matters, but according to his interrogation, once he discovered them, he was never the same again. He felt a veil had been lifted, and he could finally see things clearly for the first time. Everyone else was a zombie, a mindless, philosophical zombie. Empty and hollow, but all the characteristics of a live, functioning human being. Victor, with this newfound personal revelation, went on a killing spree, stabbing the poor unfortunates of society, the homeless, the sick, the starving, the elderly, and the poor. For each one, he carved a tally mark into his flesh. After being caught by police, he stated that the killings were all mercy killings, as he was not forcing them to die but was instead freeing them from being forced to live their meaningless lives. He argued in court that anyone who would force existence upon someone is worse than a murderer. The lunatic's existential ranting was all the judge and jury needed to hear to know a padded room and lithium injections were in his immediate future. In 1886, Arkham became home to Garfield Linz, a pyrophilic arsonist, who was responsible for starting several forest fires. But more notoriously, he also lured local prostitutes and set them on fire while they were chained to a bed. Neighbors suspected him to be responsible for the fires when they noticed he always reeked of smoke and ash and had several burn marks on his hands and fingers. It would later be revealed that these marks were self-inflicted, as Linz was so fascinated by fire that he would burn himself for pleasure. In police custody, Garfield confessed to having burned down several buildings that were previously ruled as being accidental gas lamp mishaps. He also described in great detail the arousal he felt from inhaling the smoke and watching the bright embers dance around him like fireflies. It supposedly started in his childhood, when he would entertain himself by lighting a lantern, blowing it out, and then relighting it. He claimed his crimes were his attempts at replicating the excitement he felt. Another one of Arkham's earlier inmates was a woman named Margaret Sorrow, former leader of the Thieving Magpies, a shoplifting ring made up of primarily women. Margaret would instruct the women to pickpocket and steal valuable items to bring back to her. 
The deal was that anything shiny belonged to her, while anything else the women managed to steal, like paper currency, would be split between themselves. Margaret squatted in a decrepit house, always wearing the same worn raggedy dress and with feathers and dust scattered all over the place. Her house was referred to as the nest by those working under her. In exchange for the shinies, Margaret would provide the women a network of others to help aid them, as well as personally teach them thieving skills, tips, and tricks. Margaret had been a thief since her youth, meaning she had plenty of experience to share. As the years went by, Margaret's demands became more bizarre and neurotic. She went from requesting they steal valuable things like silver and jewelry, to stealing useless junk like spoons and pots and pans. On one occasion, she asked the women to go to a department store, and instead of stealing one of the valuable handbags, to steal the glass case it came in. Margaret complained the handbag wouldn't be shiny enough to her liking, while the glass case would be. Because of this, the gang eventually disbanded and turned her over to the police, who found her in a catatonic stupor, clutching several of her shinies, with a horde of several other metallic items scattered and piling up all around the house. Christmas tinsel, silverware, keys, tin cans, and other such items. She was escorted out of the rickety house, diagnosed with photomania, as well as compulsive hoarding, and sent to Arkham Asylum, where she would spend the rest of her days. The thieving magpies would later take the name Gotham City Sirens under new leadership. The Civil War had ended in 1865, but its impact had still been left on the minds of soldiers, some more so than others. In particularly, cavalrymen Mortimer Drake and Union soldier Philip Reardon were both incarcerated in 1879. Drake joined the Union in 1863 at age 21. He was inspired by the campaigns of George Armstrong Custer, whom Drake modeled his own eccentric flamboyant personality off of. This was both his most charming and most ostracizing feature, as it put off many of the other cavalrymen from him. Many accused him of being a homosexual and making advances on others, pushing for his discharge. However, none of these accusations were ever proven. Drake remained as part of the crew for the near remaining two years of the war, having a strange mental break near the end. In his spare time at the camp, Drake would read adventure and swashbuckling novels, often trying to recreate the dynamic poses depicted in the writings. His favorite book was The Three Musketeers, by Alexander Dumas. He practiced lunging with his sword, shouting on guard at others. He also began altering his speech to sound more formal. One day, he challenged a taunting soldier to a sword duel. The taunter, not realizing the seriousness of Drake's request, took him up on it. Drake lethally stabbed the man by jabbing his sword into his chest, and then when others tried to overpower him, he began fighting them as well. The cavalry general came to investigate the camp and found Mortimer dancing with his sword in hand and a circle of bodies around him. He was arrested and sent to Blackgate, where he would stay until being transferred to Arkham Asylum upon its completion. Reardon's story was a similar one. Reardon was becoming paranoid that others were plotting to stab him in the back from behind, where he wouldn't be able to see them coming. So in Reardon's mind, the only rational thing to do was kill them before they could kill him. He shot them all in their sleep and then ran out of the camp and into the woods, where he hid for days until some Union soldiers found him. He was starved and dehydrated, foaming at the mouth and babbling about how he could see everything. After being sent to Blackgate and then transferred to Arkham along with Drake, his vision started to deteriorate. This caught the attention of Dr. Hugo Strange, who was looking for a patient with poor eyesight to use for experimentation purposes. The specifics of these experiments were never revealed until historians unearthed the notes and journal entries of Hugo Strange several years later. Warning, the following material may be disturbing to some viewers. In 1888, Strange started projects to enhance the senses of human beings. He planned to cover all five, but never fully got through with the first experiments dealing with sight. He started on a smaller scale, initially planning to develop an experimental treatment to cure color blindness. For this, 
He used a psych patient named Paul Decker, a crackpot artist who suffered from Stendhal Syndrome, a disorder which inspired him to start stealing art pieces and destroying them. Decker seemed to make progress mentally while undergoing therapy with Dr. Arkham, but was also progressively becoming colorblind, which was making him depressed. Strange offered to give him early release from the hospital in exchange for allowing himself to be tested on. Decker agreed, and so the experiments began. According to notes, the experiments involved inserting colored lenses into the end of a cylindrical device and beaming a laser from the other end into the patient's eyes, essentially converting what would be colorblind glass lenses in modern day into a laser beam zapped into the eyes of the subject. Decker was released to a halfway house and asked to document his symptoms and progress in journal entries. Decker's results initially seemed promising, however, over time, he started complaining about the saturation of everything being too bright and disorienting. Even when closing his eyelids, he said he couldn't stop seeing bright colors. Then he started going on psychotic ramblings about being able to see colors that didn't exist within this universe. Things came to a head when he brutally murdered an orderly who came to check up on him and knitted a crazy quilt out of his skin, which he wore around his otherwise naked body. After coming upon the gruesome sight, Arkham sent him back to the asylum. Amadeus could not understand how Decker had gone from making so much progress to suddenly becoming a psychotic maniac. Arkham was kept unaware of the specifics of Hugo's experimentation. For Strange's next attempt at vision manipulation, he selected Philip Reardon. But this experiment was much more ambitious as it dabbled in trying to bridge the gap between the scientific and supernatural. The aim of this experiment was to restore Reardon's vision to his fingertips, allowing him to possess dermo-optical perception and 360-degree vision. It started with blindfolding Reardon and trying to apply Braille to color perception. They would lay out colored pieces of paper on the table for him to feel with his fingertips and get him to memorize the different feels of the colors. He could recognize the darkness of colors due to the fact they absorb more heat energy and are warmer than light colors. He could also recognize the distance between him and another object from the vibrations and how his voice echoed around him. Hugo unfortunately failed at transferring optic nerves to the fingers and canceled the project. However, Reardon remained mentally affected. He began having the delusion that he actually could see through his fingertips and that his eyes were unnecessary so he promptly gouged them out. He was treated in the medical unit where he insisted to doctors that he could still see everything around him. He had developed a new neurological condition known as Anton Babinski syndrome, or prisoner's light show phenomenon. It occurs in people who are either blind or stuck in a dark room, and the brain, to make up for the lack of imagery, projects its own vision of the external world within their mind. Throughout the years, the asylum would continue to be the holding place for several odd and unique characters, coming and going like a revolving door, and also being the location where several morbid and harrowing occurrences took place, such as the shocking murder of Martin Hawkins by Dr. Amadeus Arkham, the riot of 1892, the experiments of Hugo Strange, and the Arkham protest, a protest by mental health care reform advocates to make the treatments more humane. Unfortunately, in the end, Amadeus' asylum became the living hell that he sought to avoid it from becoming. <laughs>